We'll hear argument next in case 21248, Berger against North Carolina State Conference of the NAACP. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. North Carolina law designates the state as necessary parties, the the petitioners as agents of the state, and as necessary parties in all actions challenging state statutes. When such actions are filed in state court, the petitioners are defendants and necessary parties. This lawsuit, however, was filed in federal court. And when the petitioners sought to intervene, they were denied, and a strong presumption was applied against their intervention. This outcome should be reversed for two reasons. First, under Turbovich, we are entitled to intervene. The state respondents have candidly and forthrightly acknowledged that they have a primary objective in receiving clear guidance on what law, if any, will need to be enforced. And because that administrative responsibility and interest may not always dictate precisely the same approach to litigation as our interest in defending the law every step of the way, we are entitled to intervene under Turbovich. Second, this case presents foundational issues of federalism. This court recently in Cameron held there are deep constitutional considerations implicated when a federal court is called to pass upon the constitutionality of a state law. And thus a federal court must account for a state designating multiple officials to defend its sovereign interests. There is no basis in this case for a federal court to to second-guess a state's decision that it needs a representative exclusively focused on vindicating state law. I welcome the Court's questions. You said there's no basis in this case. Is there a situation where you would think it was appropriate for the Federal District Court to deny uh, intervention where the state law provided specifically that particular state officers be afforded that right? Well, Your Honor, uh, we'd have to go through the the multi-step factors of, number one, Donaldson. We'd need to make sure it's a significantly protectable interest uh, that was identified. Number two, we'd need to look at Hollingsworth and make sure there was a correct uh, assignment of that agent and creation of that agency relationship. And then under Turbovich, there would need to be an assessment as to whether there was someone else already in the case that had that identical interest and didn't have another interest that was competing at, tugging at, the interest that they were advocating. Well, we often see in these cases, a, as a here, sort of the political uh, disagreement between the uh, two purported uh, representatives uh, of the state. And is there a situation where that is the claim uh, uh, for the necessity for intervention? you see a situation where that would be second-guessed by the uh, federal court? Well, well, I can see, Your Honor, where that could be relevant here. We don't need to point to Governor Cooper's involvement in the case to win the intervention motion, but we would point out that Governor Cooper has been an implacable foe of this law. And that's not to criticize him. Reasonable people can disagree about contentious issues of public policy. But he has said at JA 844 to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in this very case, quote, this unconstitutional law should never go into effect. Close quote. And he has also claimed for himself the authority to fire each and every member of the Board of State Elections. So he would not be an adequate representative. Now, they say, my, my friends on the other side say, well, we have four-cause removal protection. We can't be fired by Governor Cooper. And we don't think they're right about that. But even if there were, they were, that would just mean that there are unaccountable, unelected officials in charge of this paramount interest. Council, two things. One is, what do you do with Wallace v. Bone, a North Carolina Supreme Court case that says the state le- uh, legislature cannot represent the state? And I thought that that was the basis of the governor's claim that the law was unconstitutional, that this representative law was unconstitutional. And two, I still don't understand what the conflict here is. Um, The Attorney General has said, and it's not the Governor, that the Attorney General is representing the State Board. Both the State Board and the Governor and the uh, Attorney General have taken the position that this law is a constitutional, the same position you're taking. 
So where is the conflict? Other than litigation strategy issues, where is the con- — identify it for me. Okay. I'll take those in order, if I may. First, with respect to Wallace versus Bone, that — plays upon uh, my friend's separation of powers argument. There are only two judges on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals who addressed that, Judge Quattlebaum and Judge Richardson, and at Pet App uh, 102, we can see them give it short shrift and with good reason, because Wallace versus Bone was a case in which there was a clear executive uh, power being uh, tried to be kept by the legislature, issuing permits, denying permits. The other cases they cite to, the legislature is trying to spend <clears throat> excuse me, money. Um, and in Martin versus Thornburg, the North Carolina Supreme Court clearly said there is a distinction between defending a law and executing a law. Um, in addition, their separation of powers argument proves too much, because if it were right, then even if the attorney general weren't defending the law, we still wouldn't be allowed in. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Sec- that's not, no, that's not what their point is. I think if the Attorney General wasn't defending the law, there'd be another case. That's what the court below said. It'd be a different case if the Attorney General refused to defend the law. Well, but the logic, Your Honor, of their position is that this is an inherent executive power. But the problem with your decision, your position is that if North Carolina's law said every member of the legislature has a right and must be made a party to defend the state or to defend the interests of the state, then a federal court would be bound by 50, 100 legislators coming in and participating in the in the litigation. Isn't that your point? No, no Your Honor, that's not our point. Our point is that the first legislator to show up. If North Carolina law said any of the 170 members of the General Assembly can come in and be an adequate representative and focus exclusively on defending state law, then the first person to show up would be, in our view, would then, uh, going back to the text of Rule 24, would be the adequate representative of that interest. But tell me of what interest. The interest is in upholding the law. Yeah. The finding here was that the Attorney General has the similar interest. It's taking the same position. So well, why is the Attorney General inadequate to represent the same interest the legislators have in protecting the constitutionality of the law? Well, Rule 24 focuses on parties, not on lawyers. So the Attorney General's role here is not critical. What's critical is that the parties are the members of the State Board of Elections, and they have announced at Joint Appendix, page 203, that they have a primary objective of receiving clear guidance on what law, if any, will need to be enforced. And that's an administrative responsibility. And the court asked me, where is there the conflict? And we can see the conflict quite clearly at JA 366 footnote 8. There, in the run-up to the March 2020 primary, there was a flagrant violation of the Purcell principle. The Middle District of North Carolina to hear their rendition while voting was going on, changed the rules. And that's not right. There was a small window of time before voting started. But the bottom line is there was a flagrant violation of the Purcell principle with the rules being changed, and they have admitted that they did not seek a stay because of their administrative responsibilities, their concern about administrative convenience and ensuring that the election uh, went smoothly. And so that's an instance in which these two interests — Didn't the state — in the state court litigation, the same thing happened, and you're present there, and you didn't make a motion either, did you? For two reasons, Your Honor, a factual reason and a legal reason. Factually, we did not, because the uh, preliminary injunction had been issued by the federal district court on December 31, 2019. The adverse state court ruling was a couple of months later in February of 2020. And so if we had run into state court and tried to seek a stay, uh, of that second injunction, it would have been totally futile and, and pyrrhic a victory because we were still enjoined by the Middle District of but North Carolina. Tri- it was your trial strategy. 
No. It would have been Pyrrhic. There would have been no purpose to doing it because they had already decided to allow the preliminary injunction to stay in place. In addition, there's a legal difference, too, which is there's a dispute as to whether the Purcell principle applies to state court judges, and there's no dispute that it applies to federal court judges. Mr. Johnson, could could I take you back to something that you said to Justice Sotomayor? She said, well, what if state law gave every legislator um, a a right to intervene or status as a necessary party, what have you. And you said, no, that would go too far. It just has to be one. Is that is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And why is that? I mean, suppose there was something in between. Suppose um, that there was a a law passed in North Carolina that says, well, you know, um, the the Senate might flip parties every day. So we need both the head of the Senate and the head of the House. And then there's, suppose there's uh, s- uh, somebody writing the statute and says, actually, we also need the relevant heads of the committees there. You know, we need the head of the relevant House committee and the head of the relevant Senate committee. I mean, you get the idea. It's like, uh, why is it just one? Why, if, if, if we're deferring to state understandings of their own interests and the state says, actually, we need five people here, you know, wh- why would we not say, on your theory, well, then we have to have five people here. I think it's important to understand the role of state law and federal law in all of this. And here we're dealing with interests that are grounded in federal law. Uh, they flow from constitutional considerations identified in Cameron, and they are reflected in the federal rules of civil procedure. Federal Rule 5.1 reflects the paramount interest in defending a state law. Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 24B2 reflects the interest in administering a law. Those are the two interests we have here. They're not created by the state by state law. And so any hypothetical about, well, if the state tries to create other interests is not implicated by this case because these are federal law interests in the same way in Turbovich. It was a federal law interest in Kaufman. It was so a- the only rule you are advocating for is a rule that says one legislator has to be at the table in the suit. One adequate representative. And if it's an interest that, uh, is, is significantly protectable under Donaldson, and certainly an interest that's recognized in the federal rules of civil procedure, we would, rec- we would submit is, is significantly protectable, then we should be entitled. And is and there a difficulty? No, go ahead. Is there a difficulty for you? I mean, if you had come in the second time and said the same thing as the first time, it's basically say, you know, uh, uh, we, we, you know it, it, it has to be that there's a legislator here in the suit to represent the specifically legislative interest in the defense of the law, because these executive branch people, they have to worry about execution of the law. We just want a person who all they're worried about is the uh, defense of the, the law. I mean, it would seem to me that the way you would do that is to say we have a special interest as a legislator not as the state writ large, right? But you're not making, I mean, in your second motion, you didn't do that. You didn't say we have a special interest as a legislator. You said our interest is the interest of the state writ large. But how could that be? Doesn't, doesn't, the executive branch represent the state writ large? Not under North Carolina law, Your Honor. The way these statutes work, 120-32.6b, says that we are deemed to be the state to the same extent as 1-72.2. And that statute says that we are the legislature. And so we've been designated quite clearly as agents of the state, and we've been designated as — But not in replacement of the attorney general. I mean, it would be different if you said, no, it's, you know, we're, we're tired of the attorney general. The legislators now represent the state. But you kept the attorney general going. And in your first intervention motion, you said basically we have a separate interest. It's the interest of the legislature. And, you know, that makes a fair amount of sense. It's like, okay, well, that's a different interest. But now you're not saying that. You're, you're claiming the same interest that the attorney general um, has under North Carolina law. Well, un- under 
Well, no, it's not the same interest. They have an administrative interest that they've made clear at Joint Appendix 203 is their primary objective. We have a separate interest, and as I've explained, they tug at one another, and we've seen that in this very litigation. In addition, Bethune Hill came down between our first and our second motion to intervene, and that said that a state must be able to designate its own agents, and that's what 120-32.6b does. Can I ask you about Justice Kagan's questions about how many legislators would have to be present? I just want to be sure I understand where in Rule 24 you're grounding this language. So I take your point that you have a different interest than the Board of Elections because they're interested in executing the election. You're interested in defending the constitutionality of the law. There's a tug. Would it be fair to say that your position is that when the interests are different, as they're here, maybe the Turbovich you know, case cast some light on this question, that it would be rare to find that the existing party is an adequate representative because someone with different and interests that are in tension can never adequately represent the intervener's interest? Well, the, the, the test is under Turbovich, are those interests such that they may not always dictate precisely the same approach to litigation. In other words, Turbovich teaches that it's a minimal burden, and here we've amply satisfied that. I, I, yeah. I understand that, but I guess what I'm saying is if — I'm, I'm granting you, I'm saying, assuming that you're right, that these interests are not perfectly aligned between yeah. the Board of Elections and you, that it would be very rare to find that your interests could be adequately represented. It's, it's not even really much of a question. Because when the interests are different, the question of adequate representation is, is just how could you represent that interest in the rule of 24A yes. if the interest is a little bit different, potentially – intention with. Y- y- yes, y- yes, Your Honor, that's exactly right. That's the teaching of Turbovich, because nobody was suggesting in Turbovich that the Secretary of Labor was not doing a good job or that he had, uh, that he, his interest wasn't at least partly aligned. He was the petitioner's inter- uh, lawyer, and he had the exclusive responsibility, the Secretary of Labor did, for uh, challenging the election. Okay, so then let me take you to Justice Kagan's question about the, you know, succession of legislative that might come in and try to intervene, and maybe state law might even give them that right. Then would your position be that, well, all of those interests are the same. All of those interests are aligned. But when you have would-be interveners who have interests perfectly aligned, they all have the interests that you have here, say, in defending the constitutionality of the law, that then there is adequate representation. If the — well, if the interests are entirely aligned, we can't — invoke Turbovich as a basis to intervene. Right. We could point to the fact that, in fact, the uh, representation has not been adequate, and we can point to the fact that we do — we have a different perspective. We're a separate, co-equal branch of the government. So — But it, in w- Justice Hayden's, Kagan's hypothetical, it was all legislators, say, all from the same branch of the government. Yes. And I'm just trying to ground your answer to Justice Kagan when you said, well, number one can get in and numbers two through ten cannot — Yes. I'm asking you, would that be because adequate representation would be satisfied, assuming that there weren't these other factors, like they're doing a bad job? Or yeah, yes, Your Honor. That's right. So the first step under the analysis under Donaldson is to identify the interest. Then the second step is to identify whether the entity has been assigned as an agent of the state. And then the third step is if there are different interests, but only if they're different interests do you get to the Turbovich type of analysis. If the interests are identical, uh, then there's an adequacy of representation on that metric. They're but different. are we to d- defer to the state's understanding of what the interest is? I mean, suppose the state s- says, uh, you know, we think that the that, um, members of the Senate have a different interest than members of the House because they might be led by different parties. Or suppose that they said, well, members of a particular committee have a different interest than other members. I mean, there are a variety of things that states could do to define their own interests that are not just there's a legislative interest. And would we defer to the states on that definition, those more particular definitions of interests, so that we could come up with five interests or ten interests, all of which might be um, uh, expressed by various kinds of legislators? 
States can create interest. We can see that in the text of Rule 24 because it talks about property. It talks about transactions, which would include contracts. Both of those are the tr- traditional province of state law. Uh, but any time an interest is created or purported to be created, then a federal court has to assess whether under Donaldson it's significantly protectable. But none of that is relevant here because these are federal interests. These are interests that are created by federal law and that are recognized. What about, what about the answer to her question, though, to Justice Kagan? You're not answering Justice Kagan's question, I don't think. What about the committee's hypothetical? Well, it would be up to the, co- the a federal court to assi- decide whether, under Donaldson, that's a significantly protectable interest, and it would be a totally different case than this one because there's nothing in the federal rules of civil procedure that recognizes a state's interest in having a member of a committee. What we're just saying is that there are two interests but that do are. Do you defer to the state law, to the state on that, or defer some to the state, give some weight to the state on that, or what, what do you do? Well, state, states can create the interest, um, and when we're dealing with a paramount interest that's recognized in the federal rules of civil procedure, then that should be dispositive. And what states think about it in this case is not relevant, be- and the court need not address that separate consideration uh, because these are grounded in federal law and recognized by the federal rules of civil procedure. And Gasparini and Walker teach that, you know, the, the federal courts should try to interpret uh, the federal rules of civil procedure to be consistent with the rules uh, of federal procedure. Note where it is. It's under the B, permissive intervention, not what we're talking about, which is intervention of right. All right. Focusing on that for a second, what is it you want this court to hold? We are talking about a particular phrase, unless existing parties adequately represent that interest. And, as you know, most of the federal courts have interpreted that as starting with a presumption that if somebody's there with the same objective, it is adequate. Now, that can be defeated. Now, that's what happened here. And that's, you lost on that. Very well. You want us to say, when we interpret court, when you interpret those words, unless existing parties adequately represent, do you want us to say, The presumption, weak though it is, of every circuit doesn't apply. Or do you want us to say it doesn't apply just to the states? Or do you want us to say, no, you see, every private party often has problems and like to have a lot of people in the case, too. And so how do we say just the states? Or do you want us to say the rules are the same? But they didn't apply that presumption thing correctly in this case because we have a bigger interest in intervening than they thought. I I mention all those difficulties because I have yet another one. (laughs) And the last one is, since what you talked about is in B, permissive intervention, why isn't this a case for permissive intervention? Let me Suppose see. we copied your words, how important it is to get the legislature in here, how desperately the state wants it. Oh, just copy your words and say, that isn't enough to change the interpretation of A, intervention of right, but we think the court could reconsider B, permissive intervention, noticing what is there in B2 and the da-da-da. We quote you again. Now, I've given you a whole lot of problems that I see in this case if we take your path. And I also have suggested another class, but it's only a suggestion, and I'm interested in your reaction. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, So we the interest that we are trying to vindicate is not referenced in 24B2. The interest that we are trying to vindicate is the paramount interest identified in Cameron in vindicating state law. And that is recognized in 5.1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure that says that notice has to be given to a state uh, whenever. Uh, so it's not, this isn't an interest that's under permissive intervention. The Court also referenced the fact that we have the same ultimate objective, but that can't be enough every time 
time an intervener comes in under Rule 24, you have to pick one side of the V or the other, and, uh, and there's nothing in the text to suggest that a presumption should apply in that instance. In Turbovich, uh, the, the, there was no presumption. Your point is treat states differently. Well, Turbovich. From private people where the same situation arises. The, the court could say treat states differently, but in Turbovich, uh, it was a private party. There was no presumption that was applied, and it's simply not true that all the circuits apply a presumption. The Ohio Northeast Okay, Coalition, so is that your art point? You want us to say there is no presumption? The, the court doesn't have to reach that. The court- I know that, but I'm trying to get at what you think would be the best way, because unfortunately, unlike you, I might have the job of approving or writing even, uh, the case. So I'm trying to make my job easier. So I want to well, know the rule, the narrowest grounds to rule in our favor would be to say that this is a paramount interest of a state, and it's entitled under best, basic principles of federalism to have that federal interest vindicated by a representative who is exclusively focused on that. And they are not required, just because they've been sued under Ex parte Young, to forego having what they have in state court, which is a champion focused exclusively on winning the suit. Justice Breyer, anything further? Uh, you don't see much in the idea of, of, of permissive intervention. No, Your Honor. Am I assuming by your argument that the existence of the law, North Carolina law here is irrelevant? You're basically saying whether there's a law or not, we have to mandatorily let every legislative member come in. I don't know what to do with that claim given how we have ruled in a variety of different cases that a legislature can't defend the constitutionality of a law because that's up to the attorney general of each state or the law who designates who's going to defend. State law is not irrelevant, Your Honor, because it's a three-part test. One is to test under Donaldson whether there's a significantly protectable interest. Here we but have that's federal. every legislature has a legally protective interest. So go, go ahead. Yes, step two. This is where state law kicks in, is it step right. two, which is on the assignment. The, that is exclusively a function of state law as to whether the state has assigned responsibility to the putative intervener. So to be what an you're agent. basically saying, every state law that does that, everybody they designate, every cabinet member, et cetera, as a matter of law under 24A, they have to be permitted to come in. And you're saying, no, 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 it's only if they're adequate to protect that particular interest, correct? I'm saying under step three, the first one gets to come in, not the second one. Now, what happens in a case like this when the two representatives have overlapping interest? Meaning the attorney general is not saying they won't defend the constitutionality of this law. The state board hasn't said they won't. They have the same interest or an overlapping interest to yours. Where do we go with that? That's Turbovich, Your Honor. No, Turbovich was the saying that the union member and the department, the union and the Department of Labor had conflicting interests. It they was had identical interest. If we think about it as a Venn diagram, in Turbovich, the interest of the petitioner was a subset totally included within the interest of the Secretary of Labor. The Secretary of Labor had two interests. Number one, he was the petitioner's lawyer. So that was perfect identity of interest on that interest. But he had a second interest. He had an interest in the public interest. And it was the fact that he had those two, one that was identical plus an no, extra no, no, one. No, 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 but the public interest could overcome the individual interest there. Well, they said because he had both, he wasn't an adequate representative, and that's our point here. And, and, and right. it's a little bit stronger here because e- even as to the interest in defending the law, it's not perfectly the same because there's a temporal difference. They're fighting for ultimate vindication. We're fighting for the law to be in place every step of the way, including in the March 2020 primary. Thank you. Justice Kagan? Mr. Thompson, I'd just like to clarify a few points, um, and this goes back to Justice Barrett's set of questions. And if I understood your responses to her, you agreed with her that basically your case here depends on, um, on the argument that you've made that legislators 
do have different interests from the executive branch, that there is a kind of tug, in her words, um, between your purely legislative interest and their interest, which also has to take into account uh, issues of execution. Is that correct? We might be saying different things, so if I may clarify, what, what, what I'm saying is that there are two separate interests. Defending a law, which could be done by a legislator or somebody else. North Carolina has said the General Assembly is the champion of that interest, but there are two separate interests. One of them is defending the law. It's not inherently legislative, and the other is administering the law. Now, that is executive in nature. Yeah, but you're saying that the reason you should be able to intervene is because you have the defending the law interest pure, whereas they don't. They have yes. it in with a mix of other things. Yes, Your Honor, that's okay. correct. And uh, – but you're saying that that legislative interest, defending the law pure, that um, uh, we should own, we should defer to you for one legislative seat at the table, if you will, but no more. Is that correct? It's not a legislative interest. It's an interest in defending the law. But, yes, yeah, the I, I first person. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not precise. I, I just don't want to. Um, so, but, yes, the, the point is that once there's an interest that's valid, significantly protectable, the state is entitled to a champion as to that interest. A champion, one champion. Yes. And, and you're saying that it really doesn't matter that the state law in question does not define the interest in that way. In other words, the state law in question simply makes the uh, legislative members uh, necessary parties, but doesn't make this distinction about the particular interest in defending the law versus other state interests. It just says there's a, a legislators have to be necessary parties. Well, I, I think it does, actually, because the trigger, we only come into a case when there's a challenge to the constitutionality or the validity of the law. So that's what tethers our assignment as the agent to those to that interest is the trigger. If there's a challenge to the administration of a law, we're not necessary parties then. And when you say necessary parties, do you have to be in those cases, or does it, uh, does it require an intervention motion on your part? Well, in state law, we are supposed to be named, but if we're not, it's automatic intervention um, if, when we move. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Gorsuch? Justice Barrett? Just to pick up on the very end of your colloquy with Justice Kagan, was it wrong that you weren't joined under Rule 19 as a necessary party in this suit, given what you're saying about this is practically impairing or impeding your interest? That, that would be our position, Your Honor, that we have an interest and it's being impaired and that we should have been named. Thank, Thank you, you, Counsel. Ms. Theodore. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. From Rule 24's inception through today, a single principle has guided interpretation of the adequacy prong. When a proposed intervener's interest is identical to one that's already represented in the case, we presume that the existing representative is adequate. And that common sense presumption holds particular force when the existing representative is a state official charged ethically and legally with defending state interests. The presumption is further supported by the strong federal interest in requiring states to speak with a single voice at a time in federal litigation. From the vantage point of federal law, there's one state. The state as a unified entity is what matters for federalism purposes, and it's the state that has the sovereign interest in defending state law. Where one state representative decides to no longer represent that interest, like in the Cameron situation, then a properly appointed state representative can come in to vindicate the interest that's no longer being represented. That's the same way federal law requires the United States to notify Congress to enable intervention when it stops defending a statute. But where an authorized state representative is actively defending the law, Rule 24's goals of ensuring coherent presentation and simplified litigation should prevail. And this case is the poster child for why federal law puts a thumb on the scale against intervention when a state agent is already there defending. Unlike in Cameron, there's just no need for intervention here. Petitioners explicitly seek to assert the state's sovereign interest in enforceability and defense of state law. The exact interest the Attorney General is charged by statute with representing and is telling this Court he is representing. And he's not only representing that interest, 
But unfortunately for my clients, he's winning. And then on the other side of the ledger, allowing the state to speak with multiple voices at once would complicate litigation and draw federal courts into state law disputes, such as the substantial ones here about what state statutes and the state constitution means. So there's substantial cost without corresponding benefit to accepting what petitioners propose. I welcome the Court's questions. Counsel, you said uh, right at the outset that there's a federal interest that the people on each side of the case speak with a single voice. Right? Where did where did that come from? I mean, just about every case we hear, uh, we have uh, two parties representing one side of the case, often with slightly different uh, 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 interests in, in significant litigation in the federal courts. You have the same thing. If the sovereign state that is a party in the case has a law that says these people have to represent us, I don't know of any federal interest that outweighs that. I think the federal interest is having this, is in having the state tell a federal court what its position really is. So petitioner's whole argument here is that, you know, enforcing state law A, you know, enforcing the voter ID law, defending the voter ID law might conflict with an interest in election administration. We don't think that's a different interest. But if you think it is, and if you think there are different state perspectives here, um, there's a really strong federal interest in not allowing the state to say, you know, we want our agents to duke it out in federal court. So, you know, put differently, the, the possibility that different state agents defending state law might have different perspectives and balance state interests differently is a, it's a vice, not a virtue of their proposal, because it requires federal courts to referee instead of just telling the state, Look, pick someone to tell us how the state law balance comes out. You can get rid of the attorney general if you want to in all cases or all election cases or, you know, our case, but you should pick. And that's not a problem in other cases where this court has had, you know, two state representatives like Brnovich where, you know, they disagree about a question ultimately of whether the state statute violates federal law. You know, that's a question that's in the federal court's wheelhouse. But here, How to balance a state interest if it conflicts is something that the state should really just be coming into federal court and and telling the federal court what the position is. That's a pretty unusual, well, a pretty difficult, uh, eyebrow raising thing for a federal court to do when you have a political controversy with two different entities, each one having a right to intervene under state law, as far as the state's concerned. And you're saying the federal court, well, before you even get into this dispute, which obviously under those scenarios uh, is intensely political, you pick, uh, uh, I don't want to say you pick the winner, but you pick who is the real representative of the state. I, I don't see federal courts doing that as a general matter, or if they, if we do ask them to do that, that's putting them in an, int- an intensely political position when they are used to, in lots and lots of cases, having people, uh, more than one uh, uh, interest represented uh, uh, on one side of the uh, of the V? Well, we're not telling the federal court to pick. Um, we're saying when there's, you know, a duly authorized representative who's already there, who's already active, actively defending the state, you know, we'll stick with that person unless there's a really good reason to think that they're not they're not doing the job. And again, the state can always kick them out. But this is consistent with um, federal statutory law on intervention. So Section 2403B says, you know, we'll allow intervention of the state if there's not already someone in there defending state law. Well, but the federal side is very different. We have a unitary executive. The, per- the, the, the one person should speak for the United States. That states don't have to have that same perspective. Well, Section 2403B is, is specifically about intervention by states. And what it says is um, a state can intervene as of right uh, if there's not already uh, a state agency or state officer who's a defendant. So I think federal law really strongly supports our view that there should be a presumption of adequacy when you already have one state officer in there as a defendant defending state law. Um, and so – so, so I, I don't think we're asking the federal court to pick. We're saying you stick with the one who's there. And by the way, the, the, the defendant who's there is going to be the one who's, you know, the only permissible defendant under federal law. So if the legislature had entered an appearance first, they would be the one there? Well, the legislature wasn't a defendant. I mean, we, we sued the only defendants that we could sue under Ex parte Young, which would not, of course, include the legislature, uh, legislatures. So... 
Uh, so I don't think, as I say, I don't think the federal court is picking. And again, if the state of North Carolina can kick the attorney general out at any time, any time it wants, if it really thinks he's not adequate to defend the state's interest in, in the voter ID law. Um, and it hasn't done that here. And as you say, I think there's a really strong federal interest in just telling the state, you choose who represents you, but we want to know what your position is in federal court. But isn't there a position that even if it wasn't the attorney general defending the Board of Elections, that it would still, they would still be entitled to intervention? Let's say that they hired private counsel. I understand their position to be the same, I think, that it doesn't depend on the fact that the attorney general is representing them, but the fact that the interests aren't aligned to it. I, well, I think North Carolina law clearly says that the attorney general is the authorized representative of the state board of elections. Um, and North Carolina law says that the attorney general represents the state in any case in which um, the state's a party or interested or its agencies are a party. So Didn't he get dismissed from the suit? The governor got dismissed from the okay, suit. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So, okay. so North Carolina law clearly authorizes the attorney general to be here. That hasn't been repealed. Um, well, what if a private firm was representing the State Board of Elections? They just decided no attorney general. So you said the state can kick the attorney general out at any time. So let's say that's what happens. What then? Does anything change? Well, I, I, I think I would assume in your hypothetical that there's a state law that says the private lawyers represent the state board to defend the constitutionality of state law? Yeah, well, you said, like, they could kick the attorney general out any time. And I'm not saying, like, as a matter of general principle that the attorney general is not the one who typically represents the state in court. But obviously there's been a lot of back and forth, and the legislature has passed laws related to this specific litigation. So I'm just saying, would that matter at all? Let's say they say, we think the attorney general is doing a bad job, so we want private counsel. They could do that, absolutely. North Carolina law could do that. And um, then in that case, again, I don't think the legislature could come in and say we want a second counsel representing the state. They, they just pick one, the one that state law says represents the, the state. But it wouldn't change your view about whether the legislature could come into the suit, whether Berger could come in. It wouldn't change. It wouldn't. But if state law says um, that, you know, the, the state legislators – decide who the council is for the state board of elections in any particular case, that would be fine from the perspective of federal law. They could, they could certainly do that. Um, and so, again, you know, the state is in, t- is in total control here. But before you, what do you do about this, uh, Tribovich? I mean, you know, on page 539, I take it what the court said. This is a union member. He goes to the secretary of labor, says, hey, they had an unfair election in the mine workers. The secretary brings the lawsuit as he's supposed to. The union member wants to intervene. The interests of the union member and the secretary, says the court, is, are identical. But even if the secretary is performing his duties, as well as can be expected, the union member may have a valid complaint about the performance of his lawyer, such a complaint filed by the member who initiated the entire enforcement proceeding, should be regarded as sufficient to warrant relief in the form of intervention under 24A2. No mention of any presumption against intervening. Sounds like the easiest thing in the world to intervene. This man, the union member, just wanted to present some more evidence. That was it. Yes. So, so is, is, have all the lower courts just not followed that, or, or what's, what's the situation? And what do you think? Turbovich, Turbovich is a totally different situation. It, it just holds that, you know, a government official can't adequately represent at the same time both the public interest and a private union member's individual interest. And it makes total sense that showing inadequacy is a minimal burden where you have, you know, a government defendant um, and then you have a private person who wants to come in. We completely agree with that. But here, um, here the issue is that you have a government defendant on one side representing the state's interest in defending state law, and petitioners want to come in and say that they represent exactly that same interest. And with respect to their claim that they aren't focused on election administration, that's really hard to square with their view and the way they've presented this case where, in the cert petition, they intentionally disclaimed any institutional interest. Well, that's the interest. But, I'm, I mean, if a private person can very easily go in and help the federal government win a lawsuit. Why couldn't the state say, we want this person to come in? That would seem stronger, not weaker, because the private person is one of 
400,000 union members. But the state legislature, in an election case, has a pretty strong interest. Well, at the state legislature, the petitioners here have, have said in their short petition they don't represent the legislature, they only represent the state, which I think makes it really difficult for them to say they have a different perspective and they don't care about election administration when they've said we want to come in on behalf of the state as a whole. So, uh, Ms. Deere, I take that point. uh, But, uh, I mean, I guess I think that there's a kind of formalness about it. I, I mean, they are saying that they have a different interest because they have this interest pure in defending the law, unleavened by any other consideration. Now, I take, I take your point that that's in some tension with their consistent representations that they want not to represent the legislature, but instead to represent the whole state, which you might think is a kind of interest that's uh, even taking their own view, you know, leavened by these executive interests as well. So they want to kind of have it both ways. But why shouldn't we think that the more important of the two um, uh, statements that they're making to us is that they have this pure interest in defending the law, which nobody else in the uh, courtroom has, and that, you know, whether we call it representing the state or call it representing the legislature is less important than that sort of substantive difference in the interest that they have. Well, you have the Attorney General saying that his primary interest is also in defending the law, so you'd have to be deciding between two state actors who have a dispute about state law and what what each one is doing. And you'd have to be saying that the Attorney General is inadequate to defend state law, and I think that's something the Court should hesitate to do. Um, I think also the, the, the answer to the hypotheticals about, you know, the two legislators coming in are really devastating to their position. State could easily just say, you know, we think the head of the budget committee has a different perspective on defending state law um, than the head of the election committee. And, the, you know, the, the head of the budget, the head of the election committee might not uh, prioritize budget issues. And so, therefore, those, those folks should come in, too. Um, and I think, I think that as, every, as the intuition of Mr. Thompson suggests, um, Rule 24 uh, would have a real problem with that. And I, I do also want to identify some of the real specific practical problems with their, with their position that you can have two officers representing the state. Um, you know, how do you get a binding admission when two agents purport to represent the state? What if agent number one admits something and agent number two says, you know, we lack knowledge and so therefore it's denied? Is it admitted? Or let's suppose you have a damages suit against the state as a named party, like in a Title VII suit where they say a a law violates, a state law violates Title VII, you know, Congress has validly abrogated sovereign immunity. You know, let's suppose agent number one wants to put on a different 30B6 representative on behalf of the state than agent number two. Which one binds the state? Or let's say agent one says we want a jury trial and agent two says we don't. There are real significant problems with their position here. What happens if, uh, Intervention is denied on the ground that uh, the Attorney General will provide adequate representation, and then the trial goes forward. Uh, The legislature has its attorney sitting there in the courtroom, and they they say, look what what the Attorney General has done. The Attorney General has assigned one very junior attorney to try this case, and the Attorney General is declining to spend money on experts and engage in other uh, activities which we think are essential to the defense of this statute. Can they move for intervention at that time? Is it untimely? I I think that if — no, I I don't think it would be untimely if they could say there are, you know, significant new developments that um, would allow us to overcome the presumption. It wouldn't be untimely. And I think the district court made very clear in its ruling that if there were new developments that suggested that the attorney general was — somehow abdicating his responsibility to defend state law, they could try again. Well, not abdicating the responsibility, but, uh, you know, doing the, the minimum required by the Attorney General's duty under the law, but not treating this as the most important thing that merits the expenditure of whatever is necessary to provide the maximum defense of the law. The legislature can appropriate as much money as it wants to the defense of the law and make that their number one priority. What, what if at some point the Attorney General says, look, this is costing too much, we, we should settle? Or suppose there's an adverse decision and the Attorney General says, We've, we, you know, we did our best, but uh, we are not going to take an appeal. 
would intervention be allowed at that point? Uh, as for the appeal, I, you know, I think the Court's decision in Cameron makes it pretty clear that it would be an abuse of discretion uh, not to allow an appeal. Well, um, what sense does it make to allow the appeal, uh, to allow intervention at the appellate level uh, after the Attorney General has made what the legislature regards as an inadequate defense of the statute or an inadequate record. Doesn't that just make things more complicated? No, I don't think so. I think the purpose of the adequacy prong in Rule 24 is to simplify litigation. That's why courts have to decide adequacy. But again, the state here, if if the state thinks that the attorney general isn't doing a good enough job, it has a very simple way to deal with that. All it has to do is replace him. Um, And nothing about our position prevents that. Our position simply prevents them from having two people at the same time. What's the mechanism for replacing them? Um, the, well, I mean, I, I think petitioners would probably say that state law already allows them to do it, and they just haven't done it. But, you know, state law could simply say um, that if at, at the discretion of the General Assembly's leaders, they can um, replace uh, the Attorney General with private counsel on behalf of the board. And, you know, there might be a state law problem with that, but there wouldn't be a federal law problem with that. And that's, I think that's, that's the answer to, to any concern about Will they have that power under state law now? I think there's a real dispute about whether they do, and they haven't invoked it in this court. Um, but the, the position is that they have that power and they wouldn't even need the governor's signature on a new piece of legislation? I, I think that might be their position, but certainly as far as federal law is concerned, a state could give them that power. Um, I mean, there's an air of unreality about the arguments here. So you say that the Attorney General representing the Board of Elections is going to provide perfectly adequate representation. The legislature obviously doesn't think that. But you say, well, you're wrong. You know, you're wrong. The Attorney General is going to provide perfectly adequate representation in defending the law. They they don't understand what's in their own best interests, right? Well, the petitioners don't think that. But the state does think that. That's why the state has a law that designates the attorney general as, as, their, uh, as the, the person who defends state law. And I think it's important to distinguish between what petitioners say and what the state says. Um, and state law clearly authorizes the attorney general to defend state interests. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Theodore. I just have a couple really quick questions. Uh, it, 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 this may be along the same lines as Justice Alito's, but it does seem a little unfair to me that you're, you're asking us to let, to pick your opponents. Um, I'd rather, in, in court, I'd rather have only one person arguing against me rather than two. Um, uh, but I think that's a little bit of a, uh, a conflict there. I mean, what's, what are you afraid of? I mean, you should, I'm sure you could handle two of them as, as easily as, as, as one. Well, I'll say again that we haven't picked our opponents. We sued the people who federal law, ex parte young, and Article 3 allowed us to sue. Um, so we didn't make a decision there. Um, but, you know, I think what Rule 24 is about is simplifying litigation. And it, it says we don't add another defendant, we don't add another plaintiff, unless there's a really good reason. And here well, there is one. keeps saying we, we. I mean, the, the point is that it, it's, it's a court interest, and it, it's the question is whether the court should be — should be letting the state have the two representatives that under state law they say they should have. And, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't mean this the way it might sound, but I don't know why we're terribly interested in what your views are on that in the first place, because you're the one who's going to benefit if we throw one of your opponents uh, uh, out. Well, I, I think Rule 24 is there to protect plaintiffs and defendants. It's there to simplify litigation. It's there to reduce cost and burden, and that's an interest that protects the litigants, including us. Um, I think, you know, we have an interest, and, you know, I think the court probably should have an interest in sort of not announcing rules that make it easier for governments to just say we're going to make it harder for people to challenge the government. Um, So I I think we do, as plaintiffs, have an interest. Thank you. Justice Breyer, anything? I'll go back to this once more, because I did notice the footnote. Um, which, fortunately or unfortunately, count. And the footnote says, the requirement of the rule, they're talking about the same phrase, is satisfied if the applicant shows that representation, representation of his interest, quote, may be, end quote, inadequate, and the burden of making that showing 
should be treated as minimal. Now, that says maybe there is a presumption. Moore says there's a presumption. Not Moore himself, but the treatise. And, uh, uh, but minimal is the key word. So what do you, what do you say? I mean, I think we have to follow that, don't we? So all of the federal courts of appeals have understood that term of its rule to apply only in cases where there wasn't the same interest, where there was a different interest, like in Turbovich, where the Secretary of Labor was charged with both being a private person's lawyer okay, and, repre- the, and representing the government's lawyer. So that's how we understand it. We, we agree with Turbovich. Okay. Justice Alito, anything further? A Turbovich was a situation in which the private individual doesn't have a right to pick his lawyer, correct? That's, that's right. And so what Terperwich was dealing with, which is an innate conflict, which is the union member who can't pick his lawyer is saddled with a lawyer whose interest can be combined but has a separate primary interest of the public interest, correct? Yeah. And I think All right. that's private- not the case here. The case here is there's overlapping interests, but the question the district court was looking at was whether the representation was adequate. Yeah. Um, the other side, Justice um, Alito asked the question of how does the uh, uh, legislature protect itself in the event that the Attorney General is not vigorously defending the law by giving it good counsel or expert witnesses. Um, isn't that what the district court looked at, which was how vigorously was the state defending this law? And didn't it say that everything the legislature wanted to do, the state had done, but in a different way? Yes. They proposed experts, but the legislature gave an expert that gave exactly the same information, correct? I think that, yes, I think the district court looked at all of these things, and its determination is entitled to that. And it said if the state stopped doing it, they could come back and ask to intervene, correct? Absolutely right. Thank you. Justice Kagan, anything further? Justice Gorsuch? Justice Barrett? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Ms. Boyce. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. Petitioners cannot plausibly argue that the State Board and the Attorney General are not adequately defending the voter ID law. Petitioners have identified no daylight between their legal position and ours. Their evidence is duplicative of our evidence, and we have prevailed in the litigation thus far and are confident that we will ultimately prevail through final judgment. Nevertheless, petitioners seek to intervene. As we have consistently said, we have no problem litigating alongside petitioners. But petitioners cannot satisfy the requirements of mandatory intervention. They have asserted the same interest as the Attorney General, who remains in this case robustly defending the law. In that situation, a presumption of adequacy applies, and petitioners cannot overcome it. Moreover, there is a fundamental principle of state constitutional law at stake. Petitioners read two state statutes to give them the right to represent the state's interest in enforcing the law. That construction would violate the North Carolina Constitution. Thus, whether or not the petitioners are permitted to intervene in this case, we urge the court not to adopt their erroneous reading of state law, which would violate our state's separation of powers. I welcome the court's questions. See. Doesn't the fact, doesn't that state law, state constitutional law issue that you just raised show that your perspective on this is different from the legislature's? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Um, our state constitutional law issue uh, arises out of Wallace versus Bone, as Justice Sotomayor um, spoke of, and gets to the issue of whether or not the legislature, uh, the petitioners, can represent the state. Um, not to whether they might have a distinct legislative interest, as they've claimed here. And just as Justice Sotomayor said, Wallace v. Bone, um, much like the Buckley v. Vallejo federal analog, says that a legislature cannot represent a government's interest in enforcement of law, or to, to, to say the flip side of that, in defending the law. So to the extent that petitioners claim to represent our state and to have the authority to represent the state's interest in litigation, um, 
Wallace versus Bowen says that is a crystal clear violation of our state's constitution. So if the petitioners were here saying, we have a distinct interest in, in defending the law pure, let's say, which is a little bit different from what you do in the executive branch, that's their, their, their theory. And so we, uh, we, we have a distinctively legislative interest and, uh, and, and, and we're asking for intervention. Would you, uh, would you be all right with that? Like, as long as they said, we're not representing the state's interest, we're representing a specifically legislative interest, which is not represented by the Attorney General, would you be, like, come on in under intervention of right? Um, I'm not sure. I think it would depend on the particular case, Your Honor. We do not have an issue with them asserting a legislative interest insofar as the question is, does that pose a constitutional problem? We agree that they are entitled to assert a legislative interest. And would you also agree that under the intervention rule, that would be perfectly permissible? They're representing a different interest. They're asserting a different interest. You can't adequately represent an interest that's not your own. So as long as they were saying, we're here as the legislature, representing a distinctively legislative interest, all your objections would fall away. Is that correct? I think that's uh, partially correct. So because uh, defining an interest can be inherently malleable, and um, as we've seen from petitioners' briefs, you can frame what I would say is the same interest in many different ways. The federal courts use different litmus tests to assess whether or not the interests sufficiently overlap that they're effectively the same. And that's where these inquiries like, um, do the parties have the same ultimate objective? Um, are there any claims that the movement would wish to assert that the um, existing party has declined to assert? Things like that are the, the tests that the federal courts use to suss out whether or not the interests sufficiently overlap. And what's the result under that test? If, 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 uh, again, if they were saying specifically legislative interest, unadulterated, separate from any executive interests that you, you have. In this particular case, I'm still not sure that they've shown enough to prove that we haven't adequately represented their interests because, as I said in my opening remarks, they haven't actually identified any daylight between their position and ours or any claims that they wish to assert or any evidence that they wish we were putting on that we haven't put on. But we certainly concede that in certain cases that might be different, and North Carolina does seem to grant them a distinct legislative interest that would allow them um, to move for Rule 24A2 intervention in other cases. A or B, meaning I think of it as permissive intervention. Uh, Your Honor, they're certainly permitted to uh, move for for permissive intervention and, of course, have done so in this case. And we would urge the court, um, insofar as it's inclined to let petitioners intervene, to uh, permit them to intervene through that route. But the state's position is that um, North Carolina state law does recognize a legislative interest as well. And then the question is just on a case-by-case basis whether or not the attorney general, um, who's already in the case, is in fact already adequately representing that legislative interest as well as the broader right. state interest. In that no, regard, no. may I ask, um, you've succeeded in the Fourth Circuit, haven't you, in a vacature of the preliminary injunction? Yes, Your Honor. On the ground that you were likely to succeed on the merits that uh, SB 824 was constitutional? Yes, Your Honor. That's correct. So it wasn't on an equities argument with respect to administrative burdens? No, Your Honor. You're defending on the merits? Absolutely. What is the status of It's been placed on hold below waiting for this case. Yes, that's correct. Um, it has been stayed, and I would note that, um, in fact, we moved at the point that this court, court granted cert um, for permissive intervention on the legislator's behalf because we have an interest in actually seeing this case through to resolution and, and having the chance to defend law and vindicate our ability to enforce the law. Um, but the district court uh, denied that motion as moot and stayed the case until this case is resolved by this court. But I say how that about, to How about the issue of uh, this, your summary judgment motion on the merits? You made one on the merits as well, correct? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. And has that, that not, rule been ruled on? No, it has not. It's, it remains pending. Can this be case become moot on this because of the state court action? It could, Your Honor, yes. Currently, um, the, the law um, is enjoined by the state trial court um, uh, via permanent injunction, and we are currently appealing that decision alongside the legislators, um, and, and that has gone straight up to our North Carolina Supreme Court. So, if if, you, And that is scheduled for argument when? It's not yet scheduled for argument, Your Honor, but I assume it will be argued at some point. Um, this year. I read somewhere that it's likely the summer. Uh, I, I believe that's correct, Your Honor, but I, I, I don't believe that there's a firm date quite so yet. So if you lose there, then this case becomes moot, correct? 
That's correct, Your Honor. That's a point that we made in our brief in opposition because of the parallel nature of this um, litigation. Uh, it is possible that this case would become mooted. And I would also note that the parallel litigation is, is part of what drove our decision not to move to stay the preliminary injunction that petitioners have raised so frequently. The problem there, of course, was the, that the district court enjoined the law at the end of January 2019, and we had made clear that at the start of January 2020, we would need to move immediately to mail ballots for the primaries in 2020. And we knew that there was this parallel state court litigation that might lead to an injunction, once again, causing us to change course. And so we acknowledged and conceded candidly in our briefs that because of our um, obligations to enforce all of the state's elections laws, um, that we recognize it might put us in an, in an impossible situation were we to move to stay the federal court case and then immediately find that the state court had enjoined the law, which, of course, is precisely what did end up happening in February 2020. Um, so I, I just wanted to cr- clarify the record on that um, point regarding the motion. Well, to suppose, suppose that I thought, hypothetically, one, uh, intervention, which we're getting into under 24, is vast as a subject. Right. Two, and I don't know that much about it. I, I don't want to deny that I know some things. But, I mean, maybe I've gone too far in this argument. But, but regardless, uh, uh, I'm not an expert, okay? Uh, two, uh, suppose I think it's terribly important in an election case that the legislature uh, have a right to, to to be there in the court or be there in some form. There will be amicus briefs, permissive intervention. Uh, but I'm worried about saying under general. But then there's this other parallel thing, and the election's coming along. Okay? So what do I do? Um, well, our position would Aside be— Aside from saying, well, we win, but I mean— <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. I mean, our position is that as they have brought this case to the court, asking only for mandatory intervention on behalf of the state, which we think gives rise to a significant constitutional problem, the only proper outcome for this court is to deny mandatory intervention. Um, again, we are not opposed to the idea Second that, choice. that if they were to ask for permissive intervention, um, that that would be an acceptable choice. And I think for many reasons, which I can list quickly, um, that would be preferable to intervention as of right. The first would be that it inv- avoids these um, complex complicated questions of state law about who gets to represent the state, whether, in fact, North Carolina has deemed the attorney general inadequate, which we vigorously uh, disagree with. Um, The second reason would be because Rule 24A1 already recognizes an automatic right for uh, parties who are granted a mandatory intervention under federal law. It has no parallel congruent provision for state law, and one would think that if Congress or the advisory committee had intended to grant states the ability to automatically uh, admit interveners, that they would have included it there. And then finally, when the rules were revised in 1944 to add the provisions in the in 24B, the permissive intervention section, that allow certain state officials a thumb on the scale for permissive intervention, the committee specifically considered moving state officials into 24A2 and allowing them the right to intervene automatically and declined to do so. For all of, so for all of those reasons, if the court is concerned about legislators' ability to protect their legislative interest, this distinct, narrow legislative interest, the proper course would be to grant them permissive intervention, not mandatory intervention um, as of right. I do quickly, uh, in whatever time I have left, want to push back aggressively against the notion that North Carolina would be free to simply abolish the uh, attorney general. It may be true that that would be permissible under federal law. It would clearly not be permissible under North Carolina state law. The attorney general is a constitutional officer um, with uh, who is identified as the chief legal officer of the state of North Carolina. And, of course, statutory law reinforces his obligations. Um, but the state of North Carolina could not simply delegate his responsibilities to someone else. I'm sure your bosses will be happy to hear that uh, that's what, <laughs> that was your position. I believe I would have been remiss if I did not mention that. Uh, I do want to briefly touch on Cameron as well, um, since that was uh, one of the many intervention cases that this Court has heard this term, and note that Cameron um, is wholly consistent with our position. In Cameron, what the Court was concerned about was whether a state might find itself without a fair defense and with no one there to defend its laws. We, of course, acknowledge the significance of that um, interest to the states. But here, we have an attorney general who has committed to robustly defending this law, who has prevailed in a, overturning a preliminary injunction on appeal. So there is no situation where the state is going to be left without someone to defend it. 
Cameron says, of course, that a state is free to designate its own agents, and we accept that proposition. But that does not mean, A, that a state can force federal courts to hear from numerous actors, all of whom purport to speak on behalf of the state, or that a state can designate agents in a way that flouts its state constitution. And we think that both of those counsel against mandatory intervention here. Justice Breyer, anything further? Justice Justice Sotomayor? Ms. Kagan? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Rebuttal, Mr. Thiel? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Thompson. Yes, Mr. Chief Justice. Just a few quick points. Um, they claim they're not trying to pick their opponent, but they are because they filed in federal court, not in state court. If they had filed in state court, we would be there as defendants, number one. Number two, they invoke the prospect of uh, intramural fights, but there are frequently instances, it happens all the time in 1983 litigation, that a plaintiff will name a variety, a multiplicity of state defendants and they haven't been able to point to a single example of when the multiplicity of state defendants in a 1983 suit uh, somehow has created problems in terms of administration of justice. And that's because of the presumption of good faith. And they acknowledge at page 55 of their brief, candidly and forthrightly, that they have no doubt that if we come into this case, we will work cooperatively with them, as we have done on many occasions before. They invoke the role of the Attorney General, but Rule 24 talks about parties, not lawyers. And the party here is the State Board of Election, which has the responsibility for administering the election. They say that they've prevailed in the Fourth Circuit. The March 2020 primary was held without this law in effect, and the reason it wasn't in effect is because they prioritized their administrative responsibilities over the merits and the Purcell violation. And then finally, there was a discussion about, well, maybe this case will be rendered moot by the state court. There's been no uh, — the briefing hasn't been completed. There's no argument. We don't know how the North Carolina Supreme Court will rule, and it could be capable of repetition yet evading review, even if that proceeding ultimately one day did move things out. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted.